Okay, let me start. <coughs> so uh, I'm talking today. Mm, it's the first lecture on quantum geometry of modular space of geolocal systems in the presentation series. And first of all, thank you for HES who gave this wonderful opportunity to give these lectures. <coughs> so the lectures are based on joint works uh, with Ling uh, Hui Shen and Volodya Fok separately. So this is kind of older stuff and this is kind of newer stuff. <coughs> so in particular here it's 19 of four dot ten four nine one and here is zero three eleven one forty nine zero three eleven two forty five <coughs> and some other things. So <coughs> Uh, so first of all, uh, what do you want to do? Uh, we are given the following data. Mm, first of all, G, a split, uh, semi-simple uh, algebraic group over Q. And uh, mostly it will be adjoint, so we usually assume that the center of G is trivial. And usually it plays an important role. Secondly, we have S, uh, for now, which is a surface <coughs> and oriented surface uh, with punctures. And uh, usually assume that the other characteristic of S is less than zero, so it's hyperbolic. Uh, <coughs> then uh, we also have a discrete group, the mapping class group, which is defined as a group of diffeomorphisms of the surface S, modular the connected component, the diffeomorphisms are isotopic to identical to identity. So this is the mapping class group. of S. <coughs> and finally, uh, we have the character variety. So this is, can be defined as a homomorphisms from the fundamental group of the surface to G, modular G conjugation. And so it comes with the name character variety. But it also can be defined uh, as modular space of principal G bundles uh, with flat connection on S, mm, modular isomorphisms, or the name log. Uh, uh, it also has a name, a Betty modular space of local systems. G local system is the same as bundle with a flat connection. Uh, Betty indicates that it actually uh, have a variety of algebraic structures, and so this is one of them, the one we are looking for. Now. <laughs> Uh, Why is it called character variety? Why it's called character variety? I don't know, maybe be <laughs> I'm not the one who made this name. <coughs> it's, uh, you can take characters of, I don't know. <coughs> so the key point is that the mapping class group acts uh, 
on this character variety or log gs in an obvious way because it acts by uh, diffeomorphisms of s and whatever we want to do we want to do in, in, in gamma s equivariant fashion and so the goal uh, roughly is to quantize uh, this log gs character variety but actually uh, it may immediately have a question, what do we mean by this? And uh, first of all, I want to explain at least some data which relates to this. So the first comment is that the space log gs is a gamma s equivariant Poisson space. So that's a very classical uh, subject. So it goes back to a tier bot, uh, which is 82, as far as I remember. And then it was Acts, acts, acts. Ah. I mean, this was. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's a good point. Thank you. We'll try to avoid this. <laughs> so it acts. So it's a Poisson space. It's a T-board Poisson structure, but it was redone in many different ways, very important ways, by different people, by Goldman. I guess it's about 84. Uh, then for Crossley, uh, it's 90s. Also, Alexeyev, Malkin, Mainrinken, uh, uh, mm, it's 98. And uh, we with Volodya Fock, and I'll be talking about this later on. <coughs> so there are many different approaches how you do this, and they kind of all give some different point of view on what's going on, all important. So it's a Poisson structure. This means that we have a Poisson bracket on the space of regular functions here. Now, uh, as soon as you have Poisson structure anywhere, the next question, what is the center? Uh, of this Poisson. Because that's what controls, uh, to some extent, the quantization. And so let me introduce, first of all, the Cartan group to describe it. Let's see. Cartan group of the group G. Uh, and mm, so this type of variety is an algebraic. It is an algebraic variety. Uh, I would say, yeah. Assignment. Uh, because you can just I uh, I assume that uh, we have a non-zero number of punctures, so this is a free group. And because it's a free group, you just have to give yourself uh, the image of the generators, which is just some matrices if you're in PGLN. And so you have just unrestricted collection of matrices, modular conjugation. Yes. Yeah, I, I have a trivial question, maybe. Uh, this connection, principal GS bundle with uh, the flat connections, with the, on the punctures, do you have any condition on no. the punctures? No, no, no. It's a topological data. I emphasize, as a topological surface, there's no complex structure whatsoever mentioned. Uh, but if a group acts on a fine variety, it could be quite complicated space. You yes. Or you yes. take a categorical course? Uh, it, uh, first of all, it's a, for the quantization, this doesn't matter. Secondly, uh, you can consider this as a stack, but we will never go to the discussion of, for example, of its special point given by the trivial local system, which is the most singular point of the stack. And so, yes, correct, so you can have different uh, point of views of what it is, but <laughs> at least the ring of regular functions is a well-defined object there. And, and so you look at just uh, a fine variety, the section of a group, and then you take uh, functions and just invariants of the actions. Yes, yes, yes. 
Yes. <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> but not just that. So the most important thing is that the mapping class group acts by aftermorphisms of this. And we want to keep track of this action. So whatever we do, we do it in a gamma S equivariant way. Otherwise, it makes no sense. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have the Cartan group. And then uh, we consider the following map. So we take local systems and map them to Cartan divided by the Weyl group, raised to power given by the punctures of S. Is there a question? No. So what is this map? Uh, uh, this map is given by the semi-simple part. of the monodromy around punches. Uh, and mm, the claim which comes to this is that if you take the pullback of the functions on H by W raised to power n, n is the number of punctures. Then this sits, of course, in the functions on the space of local systems. And this is the center of the Poisson bracket. Uh, so just a little example. Uh, if your group G, huh? Did you miss function ATHW of the H mod W raised. Oh, 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 yes, thank you, Jan. Functions here. Functions here. Yes. So, for example, so what are we doing? So, if G is, let's say, SL2C, also I usually consider PGL2C, then uh, if you consider monodromy around puncture P, it's conjugated to some matrix, typically. Jordan block. And so uh, the semi simple part means that we associate to this, this matrix. And the action of W means that we don't know which one to take, lambda or lambda inverse. So the Weyl group in this case is Z mod to Z. And it takes by taking lambda to lambda inverse. OK. So this is the first uh, bit of data. The next one uh, is equally, if not more important. So when we quantize, when we say that we quantize some algebraic variety, uh, usually we think about algebraic variety as a complex algebraic variety. But when we come to quantization, we think about some real part of this algebraic variety. And so what is the real part? So this is the high attack mirror space. And so let me explain uh, what it is. So what are we talking about? Uh, why is it necessary to consider a real part if you want to do quantization? Uh, because we will, first of all, we will do quantization uh, not just of some algebra, but of star algebra. So we need some star algebra structure. It's already a reality condition. <coughs> so uh, if you consider the space of all local systems and take a set of complex points, then of course you have inside the real locus. But this is not the one we are really looking for. It turns out that inside there is a smaller part, which is a connected component I called plus. And uh, I will also denote it the high attack mirror space. So this guy is the high attack mirror space I'm talking about here. So uh, uh, the first comment is that the mapping class group acts everywhere. In particular, uh, on this part of the real locus. Secondly, uh, if you want to understand what's going on, we better do some example first. The question? Huh? Uh, Tachmuller tau. 
Now, plus is the real part. So I didn't really understand the question. So log gs plus. Okay. Huh? It's a notation. It's unseparated from the rest of the story. No. No, 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 no. So my goal is to explain how what this is in the simplest example of PGL2. The story is, uh, you can ask question what it is going to happen when G is a multiplicative group, when the answer is very simple. So let's start from here. So if you take G, for example, to be multiplicative group, so I said the group is adjoint, but this will be very often the simplest running example. Then in this case, this log GM, how I don't know, GMS is just a set of homomorphisms of the first dimensional homology group of S with coefficients in Z to the multiplicative group. And so just you, you can say this is first dimensional cohomology with coefficients in GM or C star if you over complex numbers. And then uh, here leaves this, so okay, so let's take, uh, uh, mm, let's take immediate, okay, this is true, but let's take complex points. We have log gm s of c. This is just first dimensional cohomology of gamma with coefficients in c star. Log gm r, you have first dimensional cohomology of gamma with coefficients in r star. But here you can take a positive locus, you consider homomorphisms not to C star or R star, but R star plus. So you can consider here log plus uh, given by first dimensional cohomology with coefficients in the group R star plus. And so it's indeed smaller. Okay, so, uh, but that's a very trivial example. So let's do the non-trivial example. So let's take G to be PGL2. Uh, in this case, this log PGL2 S plus is uh, by definition, so it has a variety of definitions, so I'll give you four of them. So you can say this is a set of all... It's all copy in PGL2 huh? Uh, so, uh, first of all, when I put plus, this means that we're already sitting in the real locus. So, PGL2R. Uh, I said, the, I mean, my story starts with the algebraic group over Q, so it's PGL2. And then I'm going to restrict to real locus, and in the real locus, take even smaller components. So, yes, it's PGL2R, but I start with PGL2. So, we can take faithful and discrete uh, homomorphisms from the fundamental group to the group PGL2R. Sometimes we say PSL2R, the same thing, uh, by default, uh, modular conjugation. And I have to add of type S. Uh, because uh, you cannot distinguish fundamental group of punctured, once punctured torus or three punctured sphere. But this is two different, uh, two different things because the difference S involved here. And so type S means that because it's discrete, we can take upper half plane and take it modular the image of rho of pi one of S. And this is supposed to be homeomorphic to S. So this gives you the type. Okay, uh, the next description is uh, uh, mm, it's the collection of pairs. So we have sigma and a map phi from S to sigma, which is a homeomorphism, mm, where uh, the sigma is uh, a surface Uh, with complete hyperbolic metric. Hyperbolic means curvature minus one metric. And I emphasize the word complete here. Uh, and phi is a homeomorphism. So phi uh, 
uh, homeomorphism defined modulo isotopy. So you can deform it continuously and you get the same object. By definition, so some kind of rigid, uh, rigidifi rigidification of this uh, surface with metric. But huh? hyperbolic metric, this means curvature is minus one by definition. Or you can say this is the same thing as uh, a surface uh, with uh, a hyperbolic metric and geodesic boundary. So here's what's going on. So if you consider a hyperbolic surface, so for example, one sponsored torus, then uh, I pretend that I'm trying to embed this to the three-dimensional space, then it somehow goes to infinity because it's complete. But then there is a unique geodesic around the neck here. And what you can do, you can cut out this neck. Then you get to the picture like that. And so this provides the equivalence between this description and this description. So we either cut out the neck or we include the neck, the same thing. Uh, but important invariant of this is L, uh, which is uh, the length of the geodesics, that's Li, uh, Lp with respect to every puncture P. Uh, around P. And uh, relating to the previous discussion, this LP is just logarithm of uh, eigenvalue of the monodromy around P, the one which gives you pos the positive number, or at least non-negative number. Okay, so we have collection of uh, non-negative numbers associated with the punctures. Mm, and uh, why these definitions are all equivalent? Just because we consider the uh, upper half plane, we consider the universal cover, which, which is over the surface uh, with complete metric. <coughs> and then we can take uh, the fundamental group of the surface S acting uh, by deck transformations on, uh, on uh, upper half plane. But then uh, this means that uh, we have a map from this group to P G L to R. And so this gives you equivalence of all these definitions. Okay, so that's what it is in this case. And again, the uh, comment uh, is the mapping class group acts on all these things. Mm. So I wanted to note that this tau s, which is the type mirror space, which is in our current uh, location, uh, uh, current uh, language, this guy, uh, it's a manifold with corners. Of depths less or equal to n. So it looks like that when you have, for example, two punches. So why this is so? Mm, uh, the point is that when you go to the limit, when this uh, next shrinks to zero, you go into the boundary. If you have two cusps, then each of the next can, can shrink to zero, and then you go into the corner, and so on. So, <coughs> mm, uh, in, if you look at the dimension of this guy, then this is three times Euler characteristic. G is number of handles. And so in particular, you see that this is dimension over R. This implies that tau s is not a complex space, a complex manifold. 
It cannot have complex structure because it can be odd dimensional. For example, for the punctured torus, uh, you get uh, three-dimensional space. However, uh, if you consider a subspace uh, of, uh, let's say, representations with unipotent monodromy, then it is algebraic, uh, I mean, at least complex manifold, and the mapping class group acts, and the quotient is MGN. And so that's the modulus space of genus G curves with n punctures. So it's a definite algebraic variety, and this is its universal cover. So, it's, so it's, in this case, it's algebraic. OK, now the next claim is that uh, all this has analog for any group G, not just for PGL2. All, I mean the spaces and some of its descriptions, not all. So um, this UN in unipotent monodromy around the punctures? Say what? This, uh, the tau un means a unipotent monodromy around the punctures. The monodromy is one, 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 Jordan block with eigenvalue value one. In other words, the pre-image of the identity under this. Whole exactly, thing. exactly, exactly. Pre-image of the identity, yes. So this is the algebraic guy inside, and the guy we usually uh, talking about when we talk about Teichmuller space, but we understand it in a little bit wider context. Okay. Now, the second part, the second point is that this space uh, can be de defined for higher rank groups. So what's the story about this? A uh, little later, you actually will see an honest definition of the space. Now I'll just give you some description of what we have. So first of all, it has several definitions. So has analytic definition uh, due to Hitchin. Uh, it's paper in topology 92. And uh, technically, he was considering the case when n equal to 0, but then was it, it, it was extended to punctured cases. And so uh, he was using a solution, uh, the existence of solutions of some a non-linear PDE, and this uh, existence of solutions was uh, guaranteed by theorems of Donaldson and Corlett. So it's a existence fact, and so what Hitchin proved, he proved that there exists a component in the real locus which is diffeomorphic to R to uh, dimension of G times the Euler characteristic. So as I said, he considered the case when n equals to 0. So the, in general, we have corners. In this case, we do not have corners, but the dimension is the same. 3 is dimension of PGL2. And uh, even if you have uh, punctures, the fact that it's topologically trivial survives. OK, so uh, another take on this subject. What do you think dimension times or times? Uh, dimension of G times the, Euler, uh, times the uh, negative Euler characteristic. Ah, two G minus two. So in the case of uh, PGL2, we get the usual number six G minus six. This is dimension of the Teichmuller space. So it's oh it's three G minus three complex dimensions. This is why we because we have no punctures at uh, the consideration right now. Now another take of this was an algebraic geometric definition. This is uh, our joint work with Valody Fock. And mm, what it gives, so it's analytic algebraic geometric, uh, it gives an explicit uh, combinatorial uh, definition and parameterization of the space.
Uh, what it gives, it gives something which looks entirely, actually, I shouldn't put here plus, sorry. Plus, it's only when I use the, when I talk about local systems. Uh, it gives actually entirely different definition, and then uh, we prove that it's actually Hitchens component, uh, that they're compatible. But uh, it has one more feature, which is very important for the quantization, and actually the quantization was the original goal. Here is this feature. <coughs> mm. So, uh, mm. in the ring or algebra of all functions on this model space log GS, and now this is algebraic geometric notion, so there is no field mentioned. So, there is a cone or plus of log gs, which has a structure of a semi-ring. So the semi-ring uh, means that we have the operations of addition, multiplication, division, but we do not have the operation of subtraction. So it has a semi-ring, and there is a statement, theorem, that uh, a point x belongs to this uh, high Müller space if and only if uh, for any uh, element of the semi-ring the value of the corresponding function uh, at the point x is bigger than zero. So this condition holds. So uh, you can phrase this in, in other terms. You can say uh, that uh, this locus tau gs uh, can be obtained by taking this log gs and taking its locus of positive points. So usually in algebraic geometry, we are not allowed to take positive points. It does make sense. But uh, this space has a particular structure, so it's a cone. Uh, and this structure allows, it's a semi-ring, so you take homomorphisms to any semi-field. And this is a semi-field. I said semi, what did I say, semi-ring, but I mean, uh, okay, this is semi-ring, but it's actually semi-field, particular semi-ring. Semi-ring doesn't have operation of division, sorry. Uh, but actually, uh, I want to say semi-field, and so, has this structure. Mm. Just sorry, hesitate. So let, let me stick to semi rings. But if I say semi field, it will have also division. So it's a semi field, and so you can just consider the homomorphisms from this O plus of log GS to the semi field. What kind of semi-field it is? So we have three operations. So we have plus, which is by definition, let's say, minimum. We have uh, multiply, which is by the, uh, sorry. In this case, uh, it, so, so in uh, positive, uh, so when you have positive numbers, so we can add them up, we cannot subtract them. We can uh, multiply them and we can divide them. And so, uh, but we also can take a maximum. And so we say that, okay, that most importantly, we have the operation of multiplication, which corresponds to mm, usual uh, addition. We have the operation of division. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I'm trying to confuse myself. So this is obviously a, a semi-field. So what I was trying to say come, comes a little later. So, but what you can do, you can take take any semi-field, K, and the one I was talking about a second ago was Z sub T. So this is, uh, as I said, it's just Z. And then you have operations of the addition, multiplication, and division. And this is minimum addition and subtraction. 
So this is tropical numbers. And so uh, uh, it turns out that this high tech mirror space can be realized as a set of positive points uh, of this uh, semi ring. But it also makes sense to consider values of this <coughs> semi ring in other interesting tropical fields, for example, in integers. And so what comes out of this also very interesting and plays important role in the story. So um, in the case, uh, for example, of PGL2C, What is the last operation? Sorry, what? The last operation, what is that? Minus. Uh, mm, if you take log PGL2 as uh, with values in this uh, real tropical semifield or integral tropical semifield. Then we get again a space which is recognizable by experts in Tachmiller sphere. This is a space of Thurston's measured laminations. And this is a space of integral uh, laminations. Uh, so let's keep this uh, in mind because this will come out later. So that not only real, po uh, real positive points of this uh, semi ring are important, but also this one will play a very important role in the story. All right, so we have this uh, high tech Miller spaces. But <coughs> mm, uh, there is also the third definition of the same thing, which was about the same time developed by. Francois Labouri, and this is dynamical system definition, which I just mentioned, not going to talk about this. It's uh, the same time, maybe a little later. Uh, <coughs> uh, it's dynamical system. Okay. So, yes. What is the definition of integral animation? Or? I did not give you the definition. I will give it to you later. I don't need it right now. Okay. <coughs> so uh, for now, you can forget this feature of the Tachmiller space. But what is important is that what we quantize is a triple. Is the real dimension of this? Like the space equal to the complex dimension of the definitely, definitely, definitely. It's a component. Yes, definitely. Okay. So back to quantization. Mm. So we want to quantize not just this uh, algebraic variety, but the following data. So if we have log gs, it has inside this high tech mirror locus. And on the top of this, we have the mapping class group, which acts uh, on this pair. And so what we really quantize is this data. Now, uh, there is a surprising feature of what's uh, going to happen. And so uh, quantization is the following one, uh, that uh, it makes manifest uh, uh, Langlands model of duality. So what do we mean by this? So uh, I consider group G, but uh, there's also the Langlands dual group. And I consider G adjoint, so I actually have to consider here the corresponding adjoint group. But still, it's Langlands dual groups. So it could be entirely different group. And I also have the Planck constant, 
the parameter of the quantization. And uh, the quantization survives this kind of duality when h goes to 1 over h. And so these features of the quantization will appear as a result of the construction. So they are not, uh, you can say that, not that you anticipate this, but it so happens that they appear on their own. But now let me explain uh, what are the structures we get when we quantize the small spaces and then do the simplest possible example when the group is actually the multiplicative group, when you see how all this, oh, this was unfortunate. Wait a second, we have more interesting questions than H bar. Uh -huh. Yes, H bar uh, is not necessarily real. We'll see. <coughs> so let me list on the blackboard the data uh, which quantization provides. So. Mm. We will do the following. Uh, first of all, we define a Q deformation. Of the algebra of regular functions on this model space. Now, as usual, when I say we define something, this means that the mapping class group X natural on this something. And so this uh, deforms to the action we were given by construction, the original action of the mapping class group here. Secondly, mm, uh, the center Uh, eventually, Q will be just a number. But uh, there is another incarnation of this when the parameter Q, when Q belongs to the ring of Laurent polynomials with positive coefficients. So <laughs> the center, uh, if Q is not a root of unity, when the center is much bigger, uh, is given by what it should be given, namely by the preimage of the regular functions on H mod W to M. So it was the Poisson center and it's going to be the quantum center, unless we had roots of unity. So that's number one. Number two is that we consider a big algebra, uh, which we call the Langlands modular double. So I denote this by A, algebra. It depends now on Planck constant, H. And uh, we assign to the pair G and S. And so we define this as follows. So first of all, we introduce now numbers. So Q is exponent of I pi H. Now Q check is exponent of I pi divided by H, and H is any complex number away from zero. So uh, now what we do, we take what we get in the first part, or Q of log Gs, and tensor this uh, over complex numbers, because now we just over numbers with O Q check of the local systems for G check, but we consider a joint group. So I put this into the game. So that's the Langlands modular double. The Langlands is apparent because we have here G check. Modular uh, reflects this H to one over H uh, behavior. And so then assuming that this number H plus its inverse 
is real. And this condition is just equivalent to saying that h is a real number or absolute value of h is 1. So h is not necessarily a real number. That's the answer to uh, uh, Grubb's question. So assuming this, uh, we introduce a star algebra structure on this algebra A sub H G S. And this is already something which uh, remembers about the real structure. And uh, finally, uh, we define uh, what we call principal series of star representations of the star algebra AH. Uh, uh, and as usual, everything has to be gamma equivariant. And so in this setup, it looks as follows. It's going to be gamma s hat equivariant in some extension. Uh, uh, mm, mm, representation uh, of this guy. So I emphasize that whatever we do, uh, we, uh, we do it in an equivariant way. Now, what is gamma s hat in this case? It's some central extension. So it looks as follows. Oh, there is a central extension. And it's extended by z to n plus 1. I'll define it later. OK, so this blackboard is a, a kind of road plan what we're going to do. So we're going to construct this data. Now, uh, mm, uh, there are some compatibilities uh, 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 here. And also, the word we construct representation of star algebra, which is gamma equivariant, I have to explain what does it mean. And so let me do it first, and then I will proceed. So I guess it's a good it's, uh, idea to have something like 10 minutes break. So I'll do 10 minutes break a little later. Oh, maybe I just do it now. So let's do 10 minutes break, and then uh, 10 minutes later, return to discussion. So I list on this big blackboard the data, which is a little complicated. But actually, uh, I still have to say something to explain uh, what do we mean by constructing a representation. So here, the key words we say that we construct a representation. And so what does it mean that we construct representation? And representation of whom? So uh, first of all, uh, uh, we define the representation space. But it's not a single space. We define a triple of spaces. And a little later, I'll give you example which shows exactly how all this works for GM, which is already not quite trivial. So we give a triple of spaces HGS and then some subspace here and it's dual. And so this is a Hilbert space. Uh, this is a topological space uh, it's topological Frechet space and so it basically has the same structure as uh, some kind of Schwarz space so it is some kind of Schwarz space and this is the dual
So that's number one. So that's where the representation lives. Now, how it lives there? So we have two guys. So first of all, we have this extended mapping class group. And it acts on each of the spaces. So it acts on HGS. It acts on the Schwartz type space. And it acts on this dual. But on the other hand, so it acts. But on the other hand, we have this algebra, which quantizes the algebra of functions on local systems. And actually, naively, you wanted to say that you have just a Hilbert space. So you don't consider this S. You we want to say that you have a unitary representation of the mapping class group, extended mapping class group on the Hilbert space. And you wanted to say that you have the action of this algebra here. But in reality, you don't get it. So in reality, what you get, you get some action on the Schwartz space. And therefore, you have action on the dual space. But this one, you do not have. And so this diagram is uh, what actually happening. So once again, so you have uh, the group, the algebra, and they act on the spaces. And they're compatible. There's a compatibility. Mm. First of all, notice that the mapping class group does act on this algebra. And so I can write down that if you take any element of the Schwartz space and act uh, on it by uh, some algebra element, and then uh, act by representation of gamma, this is the same as acting by element gamma of A on rho gamma of S. So this is compatibility of the discrete group action and the algebra action on the spaces. And also, don't forget the fact that the star representation, which means just that. OK. So now this is a complete package of uh, what do you want to do? And so now let's do this for GM. Yes? Uh, what is the meaning of that a h bar does not act on HGS? Is it means that it is not gamma, gamma hat equivalent way or something? What does it mean? It means that it does not act. Is it, can, we, can we realize it as a module over a h bar? It means that it does not act. It does not act. You will see in a second. It does not act. So the whole design was to uh, deform algebra of functions and construct its representation of the Hilbert space, and there is no such representation. Just give me a second, you will see. So the problem is that it kind of does act, but it acts by unbounded operators. And unbounded operators are not really operators. They have some domain of definitions, but you cannot apply them to any vector. Uh, and so you have to find the maximal domain of the definitions of this uh, 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 prospective action. And that's exactly the space, the Schwarz space. OK, so uh, let's do the simplest example. So remind you that um, uh, we have the modular space uh, related to multiplicative group, which is home from first dimensional homology to GM. And this is actually a split Poisson torus. And let's do it more generally. So, more generally. Uh, let's suppose we have just a lattice. Let lambda be a lattice uh, with a skew-symmetric form.
like that. And so uh, the main example is, of course, for ours, lambda is first dimensional homology of Z. And the form is intersection pairing. And then we can assign to this the split torus, T lambda, which is just home from lambda to GM. And uh, to any element of the lattice, we have the corresponding uh, regular function, x sub lambda on this torus. And we can define the Poisson structure. So the Poisson bracket between x lambda and x mu is given by the uh, pairing of lambda mu, x lambda times x mu. And so it's a quadratic Poisson structure. Now, uh, we want to quantize, as usual, we want to quantize not just this complex points of the torus, but real positive points of the torus. So let's see how this works. Mm. Uh, first of all, so we need to proceed uh, following the plan. So first of all, we need to define a Q deformation. OQ of T lambda. So how we define this? So I remind you that we have the Heisenberg group. Uh, it's just a central extension mm. it's called h lambda so it's a central extension by z and uh, with a standard uh, group law so if we are encoding elements here as like a 1 lambda 1 and want to multiply them by a2 lambda 2 we get a1 plus a2 plus pairing lambda mu and lambda 1 plus lambda 2 now we just say that our deformant algebra is just a group algebra of this so oq of t lambda by definition uh, is a group algebra of the Heisenberg group. Or... Huh? AIs are integers? Sorry, what? AIs are integers. AI integers, yes. So it's a pair integer and element of the lattice multiplied by another integer pair of the lattice, so you get this formula. So or, equivalently, you can say that OQ of T lambda is a free Z Q Q inverse model uh, with linear basis X lambda and multiplication law is that x lambda multiplied by x mu equals q to lambda mu x lambda plus mu. Okay, so we have the quantum torus. Now uh, we take the double of the quantum torus exactly as we see on the blackboard. And now we want to represent this in some Hilbert space. So we wanted to construct the representation. So I can maybe for completeness write down the part two that A H of T lambda is by definition this OQ of T lambda 
tensor of Chekhov to lambda. And now the key part is the theorem, which is nothing else but adaptation of the Euler presentation. the mm. representation of the integral metaplectic group. And so uh, it says exactly as uh, we were talking about here, that there exists a triple of spaces, this S lambda in some Hilbert space lambda and the dual to this Hilbert space. Mm, such that, first of all, uh, there is an, uh, a unitary action of uh, the metaplectic group, which is automorphism of this lattice preserving the bilinear form mm, on the Hilbert space also preserving the other two. And secondly, if we have this reality condition, H plus H inverse is real, uh, then uh, there exists a star algebra structure on this AH. And SP of lambda tilde equivariant representation. Now how this goes? Uh, in order to see how this works, uh, we just do the simplest uh, possible example. So we just consider the case. So this, this metaplectic group is the analog of this mapping class group? Yes, 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 yes. So in this case, uh, so as always, we have algebra and we have a discrete group. So the discrete group in this case is a metaplectic group. It's basically a symplectic group by extended by z mod to z. Uh, the algebra is a double modular double of the quantum torus algebra. Now, a representation comes as follows. Is that algebra structure on this tensor product is Tensor product. Just the usual tensor yeah. product structure. Over C, yes. So the simplest case uh, is when we have lambda to be Z square. So it comes with a basis E1 and E2, it's a basis, a symplectic basis. This means that the pairing, symplectic pairing between E1 and E2 is 1. And uh, it's convenient to introduce square root of Planck constant. And then uh, we consider the Hilbert space H to be just functions on real 9. L2 of R, and we think about them as just collection of functions of variable T. And now we need to define the action of the tensor product of two quantum torus algebras. These quantum torus algebras, they are generated, so they are generated by two generators. And so the generators is X1 and X2, which corresponds to the basis, and they act as follows. This is translation by 2 pi i beta. And this is multiplication by beta multiplied by t. And the second operator, so y, is uh, translations by 2 pi i divided by beta and multiplication by t divided by beta. Beta is a multivalent function, so we choose it. Beta is a number. H bar is complex. Yes, it's a number. You choose a number. So, for example, uh, you can take assumption real part of beta is non-negative. Okay. 
Okay, it doesn't make a big difference because you just uh, rename the generators of your algebra otherwise. So this is the generators, and what you immediately notice, you notice that axis commutes with y's. And uh, that x1 and x2 generate this OQ of T lambda. And that y1 and y2 generate OQ check of T lambda. Because exponent of 2 pi i beta squared is ex exactly, uh, if you commute them, you'll see that you'll get exactly Q squared. Where, where do you use that h plus h hmm? inverse? Where are you using that h plus h inverse in r? Oh, not yet, okay. not yet. But the second thing which you notice, I said that they act in L2 of r, and they obviously do not act there at all, because you multiply function L2 by exponential function. And so if beta, for example, real, it does make sense. Or you shift to complex domain, you also cannot do this. So they pretend to act, but they do not act. So now, actually, it acts somewhere. It acts on a space of functions like exponent of minus t squared plus a t plus b multiplied by some polynomial. And so at least there is some uh, infinite dimensional space in which they actually do act. And uh, then, uh, we actually define the space on which they do act. So this is the Schwarz space. So the Schwarz space inside of H, which I remind you is just L2 of R, Uh, is the collections of functions f of t such that f decays uh, faster than exponent e to ct for any c. And if you consider the Fourier transform, it has exactly this property. And so you can also say that s is the maximum subspace uh, of L2 of R uh, such that for any element in this A sub H, uh, the putative action on a function does belong to L2 of R. So if you replace this A H algebra with the algebra of usual uh, differential operators with polynomial coefficients, this would be the definition of the Schwarz space. So this is the functions which are smooth, which means you can apply any differential operators and decay faster than any polynomial. So that's the condition that if you multiply by any polynomial, uh, by any operator with polynomial coefficients, you still live in L2 of R. So in this case, is the algebra is different. The algebra is this uh, tensor product of two quantum tori. And that's a sufficient, that, that's actually the condition which guarantees that everything works. Now, uh, the key question, so what are the conditions on H? So, so far, what we did works for any H. So, but the point is that if you want to introduce a star algebra structure, then you do need some conditions. Uh, you want it, your representation be not just representation of algebra, but be representation of a star algebra. And so in L2 of R, you have the natural structure, and so it induces the following one. So uh, there is a star for real and star for unitary, so to speak, two kind of stars. And so this one works when h is a real number. And in this case, uh, you, have the you have the x lambdas, and star of x lambda is again the same x lambda, and you have y lambda, and again it's real with respect to this star, I denoted it by r. 
So uh, generators uh, of this uh, quantum torus algebra, both of them are real. And also uh, star of Q is just Q inverse. And also star of Q check is Q inverse check. OK. So this is a one reality condition which works. But you can also consider absolute value of h equals to 1. That's another one. And here it works differently. So you have this x lambda and y lambda. And the star interchange them. Uh, and you also uh, see that it acts on q. OK, you can write it the same way. That you have q and you have q check. And the star u interchange them as well. And so in, in the case of this uh, real structure, you clearly see that you cannot say that you, are, you have a representation of the algebra of Q of T lambda. You cannot say that you have a representation of quantum torus. Because you have a representation uh, of such a star algebra where involution interchanges the two factors of the torus. And so it's not a representation of the torus algebra. And so in some sense, uh, its uh, relation to this real component is kind of a little bit more elusive, but still. OK, so these are the uh, uh, setup where we already defined the action of the algebra. Now the question is how we define the action of the group. And that's a typical uh, story of the value representation, that the group acts by automorphisms of the lattice with the form. So it preserves all the structures. But when we define representation, we broke the structure. We broke the symmetry. And so <coughs> the representation tells you how you, so to speak, reconstruct the symmetry. So the claim is that in this case, the metaplectic cover SL to Z hat acts on mm. this H, which I remind you is just L2 of R by uh, unitary operators mm, of the following shape. So how it goes. So if you take any element gamma in SL to Z, so you assign to this some operator, which takes a test function f of x and turns it into function kappa gamma xy uh, f of x dx. And so that's a new function of y. Now, uh, this uh, k gamma needs to be defined, but you need to define it only for the two generators. So if you have t generator this type, unipotent, and s this one, uh, then Mm, the corresponding kernel kt of xy is just uh, exponent of minus x squared over 4 pi i delta function of x minus y. And ks of xy is uh, 1 over 2 pi i exponent of xy divided by 2 pi i. So that's it. So you have it on the generators and basically tells you how to define uh, uh, in the protocol generators with the caveat that you have a representation of the central extension. But still, OK, right now I said that this comes from the series of value representation. But where actually these operators coming from? So these operators are. Uh, uh, forced on us by the condition that repre representation of our algebra, which I already defined, A, uh, supposed to be gamma equivariant. If you just write down the conditions as the, the, the gamma equivariant, then we see that these kernels are uniquely defined if exist. So let me just give you one example. Mm. Uh. Sweet. 
So uh, a reminder that we have conditions that rho gamma of A acting on S is the same as gamma of A acting on rho of S, rho gamma of S. And so for Ks, for the simplest generator, uh, this condition means uh, the following equation. So if you look at the kernel, then if you translate this by 2 pi i beta and keep y, this is supposed to be exponent of beta y ks of xy. That's what this commutation relations means for the first of the generators. Then for the second, mm, well, still on x, so y plus 2 pi i beta gives you the same. But also, uh, if you write down the second set of the generators and equivalence with respect to this, you get the dual set of conditions. Now, with 2 pi divided by beta shift, and ks of x y plus 2 pi i divided by beta is exponent of x divided by beta ks of x, y. Now, this reflects the two sets of the generators. And if you look at this, you'll see that this kernel of two variables uh, is defined uniquely because we know what happens when we shift by basically by beta, and we know what happens when we shift by beta inverse. And if beta is irrational numbers, that's it. So we cannot have more than one function which satisfies this property. Still, it's uh, not given to us that such a solution exists. And so you, here you see the solution. But at least if it exists, it's unique. And so this shows that, for example, when we try to uh, see what happens when you multiply the generators, so we basically, up to scalar, have no choice. So that's why we are bound to get some projective representation. And so here you clearly see why this modular double matters, because uh, it works in such a way that it produces kind of double system of difference equations, which determine your function as good as a single differential equations in, in usual story. Another comment about this representation is that if you happen to miss the second part of the generators, for example, if you just have this one, so how you recover this one? So uh, you can just say that you want to consider all operators which commute with a given, uh, uh, given generators of quantum torus algebra, and then you recover this, uh, the second algebra. So the fact is, that if you take this uh, OQ of T lambda, in this case, OK, this particular lambda, two-dimensional, uh, mm, then it centralizes is the centralizer of OQ hat of T lambda in our representation, and vice versa. So one is centralizer of the other, and the other is centralizer of one. So that's where the statement, so originally I said, look at this blackboard, I said that we are going to get representation of OQ of log GS and OQ check of log G hat of S. So a priori, we start with constructing just left-hand side, representation of the left-hand side. But then when we look at uh, on all operators which commute with this representation, so we find out that actually we know this algebra, and this is just OQ of log g hat. And so in this sense, it's not kind of, we're not designed it to be Langlands invariant. It so happens that it's Langlands invariant. And if you go to the other side, if you start no, with not from the group G, you start from the group G hat, you do a different construction related to the group G hat, and you represent OQ of log G hat, and then you look what kind of representations you got, and you realize that actually this is the same representation you got the previous time, but this time the centralizer of the right-hand side is the left-hand side. Is this structure related to the fact that the tropical points for one parameterizes the basis of functions in one? Not in my head. Actually, it's a very, uh, so Joel 
is uh, very far ahead of uh, this discussion. So there is uh, several incarnations of uh, certain kind of dualities which interwoven in this business, which all interchange the G and the Langlois dual group G. And uh, Joel asked how they are related to each other. We will see actually more relations uh, on, on the course, but it's not completely clear uh, how one is dictated by the other. Okay, so now we constructed uh, this representation for, uh, we, we, we defined quantization for, uh, for the group GM, and so now we want to define the quantization for other groups than GM. And so let's at least uh, uh, describe some strategy. So how we, what do you want to do in general? So before I proceed any further, I just wanted to say that what we deal uh, here with is a, just a standard Heisenberg construction, but in a different uh, star algebra structure. And so uh, people play with this construction before. So uh, I'm not sure who played first, but for example, Kohn's, Kohn, Alan Kohn played. And especially important is uh, uh, Ludwig Fadeev. Uh, uh, played with this construction. And so, uh, as, as we will see, this kind of modular double construction will go everywhere uh, through the story. I emphasize once again that what's surprising here is that the Langlands duality comes naturally. So we kind of didn't expect it, but uh, we are getting it. Okay. So, what's the next step? So you want to have a strategy uh, to quantize uh, log gs for any g as before. And it seems that uh, discussion uh, suggests what to do. Because whenever we quantize something, so Usually what happens, you find some kind of Darboux coordinates, and then you quantize these Darboux coordinates, and you declare that that's your quantization. And so let's try to do the same here. So the idea is, first of all, to find a birational isomorphism. Between the space we want to quantize, log gs, and certain split torus for a certain lambda. This is some split torus. So let's call this I. And the second part of the problem would be to quantize uh, T lambda as before. And then declares the victory that that's okay. We quantized the modular space of local systems. There are some objections to this plan. You know, there's an anecdote. So when Napoleon took Vienna, so he, he, he asked the burgomaster why there was no salutation to my, uh, you know, victory. And the burgomaster said there are 14 reasons for that. And Napoleon said, okay, name me them. Said, number one, we didn't have gunpowder. Said, okay, enough, go. So in this case also, there are some kind of uh, issues. And there are many of them, at least two of them. The first one is that such, such a birational isomorphism generally does not exist. That's a theorem. You can say that if you consider some general S and general G, 
then you get some algebraic varieties. This algebraic variety is not rational, period. So you cannot uh, find such birational isomorphism. Should even be uh, Poisson. Uh, you, hmm? would, you would want it to preserve Poisson structure. Yeah, definitely should be Poisson, but <laughs> even before that. So we should have, you're right, uh, we should find some Poisson isomorphism. Uh, Poisson. It's even much stronger. But forget about Poisson. Just finding birational isomorphism is impossible. It does not exist, so the story ends here. So, but even if it would exist, there is actually a more serious uh, uh, issue that the group gamma S acts on this model space log GS in nonlinear way. And uh, the claim that it acts nonlinearly means that it acts uh, through a big, uh, very large quotient. So when it acted on uh, the split torus in the case of the GSGM, it acted through the quotient, which is just symplectic group. It's a very small quotient of the huge mapping class group. But when it acts already on the model space of PGL2 local systems, it acts uh, basically faithfully. So, uh, as the action the, is huge, and so it's certainly nonlinear, and this means, in particular, that it cannot uh, preserve the, the chosen coordinate system. So you have some kind of nonlinear situation. Nonlinearly, if and only if G is non-abelian. If you can write the nonlinear part, I didn't understand what you say properly. What do you mean by nonlinear? Uh, this means, that's a good question. This means that even if you would find some, uh, some isomorphism with split torus, the action of the mapping class group is going to destroy it. Because uh, if it keeps us, it means that it acts through a uh, quotient, which is symplectic group, acts by monomial transformation of the split torus, even if you find one. But it cannot, because the action uh, basically is, uh, you know, it doesn't factorize through anything. It, it cannot factorize through the small quotient. OK? So mm, uh, this means, for example, that if you happen to find, if it does not exist, but if you happen to find such birational Poisson isomorphism with one torus, your action of the mapping class group will generate infinitely many other such uh, coordinate systems. And so you, don't, you, you certainly do not have any preferred one. That's for sure. But what's worse, I said it uh, does not exist. And so there is a big issue comes up that uh, you need a nonlinear analog of the value representation. So that's the second problem which we need to deal with. And so how are we going to deal with these problems? So let me. Mm. And here. <coughs> First of all, so that's our strategy. First of all, we want to define, we cannot uh, get away with log GS, that's for sure, because it doesn't have uh, parameterization. We want to define a new model space. So we call PGS. Uh, and what is extremely important that this label of the surface uh, change uh, the flavor. Now it's different as. And so this means that it's defined for any surface with corners. 
So for example, it could be like that. Or you could have some holes here. Or you can have some handles. So we want to be able to consider surfaces with these uh, corners. It's number one. You will see why a little later. Secondly, mm, we want to prove that this model space PGS uh, uh, carries a, again emphasizes gamma S equivariant uh, cluster Poisson structure. And so I put in red what we don't have. So we don't know what this means at the moment, and we don't have this definition yet. And uh, then I'll explain that this implies that it can be quantized. And in particular, it means that it does have this uh, birational isomorphism with actually infinite, infinitely many tori we were talking about. And so it looks like we quantized uh, what we wanted, but it seems that we quantized a different space. So here comes the third part of the story. So we use B uh, plus additional symmetries uh, of this model space PGS to uh, deduce from this uh, quantization of log GS in the case of the surface with punctures because we didn't quite, uh, again, so our goal is uh, quantizing local system on surface with punctures, but we are going to extend uh, the notion of the model space, of model space of local systems in such a way that it enables to do this. Okay, to implement this. Sorry, my question. So gamma s, we say the uh, every class group of surface, does it respect the punctures? Uh, so it can, Interchange punctures, that's okay. Okay. And when you have this uh, corners, does it uh, rotate corners? You can rotate the corners. So, for example, you can consider the polygon and rotate it. Is the gamma both phase S? Hmm? Maybe the both phase? Yes, this is both phase S. That's right. Sorry. But again, your question, for example, about include punctures or not to include punctures, so it kind of made of taste because. Uh, works both way. <coughs> okay. And so now, if you want to implement this plan, first of all, we need to define this new model space. And it's actually indeed a new model space, so it wasn't considered before. New because uh, of what's happening at the boundary of the surface. Otherwise, we have it. We had it. So then the next step is the model space PGS. So the first question is who is S? So for S we have the following picture. So we have some surface with boundary. Then the surface can have punctures. It can also have marked points on the boundary. So it looks like that. And more formally, it says that S is a decorated surface. Uh, which means that it is an oriented uh, 2D surface 
these uh, marked points who are the marked points they by definition either punctures or special boundary points so we have two kind of marked points and we assume that the total number of marked points as uh, positive so we do not allow surface which doesn't have boundary and doesn't have punctures and we also assume that on each boundary component uh, we have at least one uh, special point. This means that if you consider boundary component which does not have special points, then actually we think about this just as a puncture. So you can say alternatively that the puncture is a boundary component without uh, special points. But in this case, topologically, we can just shrink it to the puncture, and that's it. But if the boundary does have this red special points, we cannot shrink this to a puncture because there is some additional data on the boundary, and so uh, we just call them special points to distinguish from punctures. Okay, now, uh, so the simplest example of this decorated surface, as I said, is a polygon. So in this case, there is no topology, but there are special points. Okay, now in order to introduce the corresponding model space, I need to remind you a little bit about uh, general facts about uh, semi-simple Lie groups, just a tiny bit. So first of all, uh, we have a so-called flag variety. Which is uh, defined as a collection of all Borel subgroups. In G. And uh, if you choose one of them, then you can identify this with G mod B. Uh, secondly, it has a principle of fine space. And uh, it's defined, actually, as G mod U, uh, where U is a maximal unipotent. And uh, in the case we are really interested in, in the case when G is adjoint, there is a much more satisfactory definition. So this one is not, this one is, this is a definition, but the problem with this definition is that we say, okay, we pick some uh, maximal unipotent subgroup like here, but here we have a definition as a modulus space. It's a modulus space of something, of Borel subgroups. And so if G is a joint, we also can define A as a modulus space. And so in this case, we say that A is just a modulus space of pairs U and Psi where u is a maximal unipotent and psi is an additive character uh, which is a non-degenerate character.
of u. Now, what non-degenerate means? First of all, let me give an example. So if you take uh, SL3 like A12, A13, A23, then a character psi uh, could be association to this the following number, like lambda 1 times A12 plus lambda 2A23, where this is a non-zero number and this is a non-zero number. That's what non-degenerate character means. And in general, we say that H, which is B divided by U, where B is a normalizer of U, it acts on such psi's. Uh, and non-degenerate by definition means the action is sim simply transitive. Okay, so this is the definition we're going to uh, keep in mind because we work with a joint group. Uh, now the next uh, piece of data is that uh, we have, of course, canonical projection from principal affine space to flag variety. Oh. Which is a principal H bundle. And it works by assigning to unipotent subgroup and a character the normalizer of U. And because uh, we forget about psi and the psi's form principal homogeneous space over H, that's why we have the principal H bundle. And finally, let me start with the notation. Mm. Let's suppose that X is a G set. Then uh, we want to denote it by conf n in X, just collections of n points, meaning X to n, divided by the diagonal action of G. So we call this configuration space of points. So, sorry, sorry the, the notation G by B, what is B, small b? What is the difference between D, D, that B and G by B? So we have a maximal unipotent subgroup, like the subgroup of upper triangular matrices. Okay? And B is a normalizer. So if you take all, uh, this is strictly upper triangular matrices with ones on the diagonal. This is U, it's unipotent matrices. And then we can have soluble matrices. We can have matrices which are upper diagonal but can have anything on the diagonal here. So this is a normalizer of U. It's called B. It's a, a maximal, a maximal soluble subgroup. It's by definition a Borel subgroup. And so this B contains U, and so U is a normal divisor there. So we can take a quotient. The quotient is a group of diagonal matrices, isomorphic to the group of diagonal matrices. It's isomorphic to Z Cartan group. Okay? And so uh, if you look what happens here, so uh, the, the collection of pairs U and Psi is a is a G set because the group G acts by conjugation on the whole thing. Now, how it acts by conjugation? What is the stabilizer of this point? The stabilizer, first of all, if you want to stabilize U, as I just said, you have to be in B. So the stabilizer of U is B. But then if you want to stabilize the non-degenerate character, then uh, the quotient B mod U have to act it acts trivially. So this means that actually your stabilizer reduces to the subgroup U. Therefore, the stabilizer of the G action on these pairs is just U. Therefore, the homogeneous space itself is G mod U. That's why it's identified with the uh, principal affine space defined as G mod U. Okay? Uh, I actually think that I better stop here because uh, I'm supposed to stop at 2.30 and I probably don't want to give you the main definition at the very end of the lecture. So the very beginning of the next lecture, so what are we going to do next? In the very beginning of the next lecture, I'll finish this uh, talking about this definition. 
Then I will explain uh, the key properties. So the main thing which happens is that we define this uh, new model space related to decorated surfaces. And it enjoys some properties which the usual model space of local systems certainly do not have. So, uh, and we will talk about these properties. And then uh, we will talk about the main property. So we'll, there will be discussion of examples of uh, PGL2. And then there will be the main property of the spaces. That these spaces have lots and lots of uh, uh, coordinate systems uh, in which the Poisson bracket. Uh, the main point is that this space turns out to be a Poisson space and has lots of coordinate systems, uh, rational coordinate systems, which has the properties that the Poisson brackets between the generators are uh, quadratic and given by some skew symmetrizable, skew symmetric matrix. And so uh, the main property of the space is that you have infinitely many of these uh, coordinate systems, but if you know this Poisson coordinate systems, but if you know one, you know all the other. So this is called cluster Poisson structure. So its main feature, as I said, that you have infinitely many coordinate systems, but it's enough to know a single one to reconstruct all the others, to, to, to at least to pretend that you know all the others, to kind of get them. You can get, you can get in, in theory, all the infinitely many uh, of them. So that's the main point. And so after that, I will be talking about the general structure, cluster Poisson variety, I will quantize this. And so this way, we will be basically down to our list what we have to do in order to quantize. So next lecture, maybe begin of the, uh, the suit lecture, we will have already the space quantized, and then we'll start, we can start talking about the application of this construction. Okay, thank you.